Hi, my name is Kristen Beckman, and I am the deputy mayor here in the city of St. Paul. And I am really excited to be here tonight. Uh, we have done, as the city of St. Paul, we've done a lot of due diligence about the redevelopment of the Midway site. And we've collected a lot of community input. And so it feels like we are at this place in time where we need to share a lot of the due diligence that we've done and prepare to collect even more community input. So tonight is a part of that process of the dialogue I feel like we've had with community members and neighbors and business owners and representatives of the area. And so I really appreciate all of you coming out. There's some of you I have seen at multiple events coming out time and time again to learn about this project. And more importantly, give us your feedback on um, what you hope for this project, what your concerns are around the redevelopment. And so thank you for being here. Um, one of the things I wanted to make sure everyone understood is that we have two different processes that are going on simultaneously right now. And I want to explain a little bit about that and how we're going to sort of tackle them through this agenda so that everyone understands sort of the two distinct things that are happening. So first of all, um, we have the planning process that's been going on. And the Community Advisory Committee, who I think I saw a number of members of the affectionately named CAC, um, are here tonight. And those Community Advisory Committee members were appointed by the mayor and the city council to come together back kind of November of last year to look at the soccer stadium site plan and the master plan for the 35 acres. So that community advisory committee has been meeting with the designer of the soccer stadium, the designer of the master plan for the 35 acres. They have reviewed those plans. They've asked hard questions. We've had really good conversations. The members of the CAC have really pushed us to think about this development and how um, the neighbors have aspirations for walkable blocks and bike paths and green spaces and um, services and shopping areas that is accessible to everyone in the community. And so through that process, that yeah. CAC is a task force of the Planning Commission. And the Planning Commission is going to meet this Friday at 8.30 in the morning, Friday, June 10th, in City Hall to hear the report from the designers and from the task force and then collect public opinion and input on that process. So one of the things we're gonna to do tonight, Donna Drummond, who is our planning director in the city of St. Paul, she's gonna share with you the soccer site plan and then the, the master plan for the 35 acres and make sure that everyone has information on that and then there are tables around the room that have more details. Like if you really wanna get into the weeds, there's lots of weeds over here to get into. Um, so then we'll go to the tables and collect your input on that. But our main goal is to make sure you have all the information we have so that you are informed and can come into the public hearing at the planning process on Friday or submit written testimony to the planning commission. And so you have the information so you can give that feedback. The second process that is going on is that as a part of any large redevelopment, we do an environmental review. And frankly, um, the first time I heard this, I thought an environmental review meant really like in the environmental, like brown space, uh, you know, is it, is it polluted? What's in the ground? This is really environment, like our whole environment, the sound, the traffic, how people move around as pedestrians, where bikes and cars go. So the environmental review, that process has also started because we have, there have been a ton of questions. Where are people going to park? How are they going to move off of the green line? Where are they going to cross the street? Will the sound get to my house? Will I hear the game on game nights? And so we hired a consultant to do that environmental review for us. We've gotten that review back. And now it has opened a 30-day comment period where you will get to see the review. And Josh Williams from our planning department also is going to go over those details tonight. So again, you have that information so that then you are uh, armed with the information so that you can comment during that 30-day comment period and help us figure out, did we miss anything? Do we need to be thinking about things differently? You live in the area, and when you cross the street, you cross here, and this is your experience with trying to get across the, the anchor chains on the green line, and this is your experience at these corners. And so that, the draft AUAR is out, and the 30-day comment period is opened, and it runs through Wednesday, July 6th. 
And so Josh is going to give you a lot of information about the AUAR so that you can comment before July 6th. And so after Donna goes over the master plan for the 35 acres and the site plan for the soccer stadium, and Josh goes over the AUAR, Jonathan Sage Martinson, our Director of Planning and Economic Development, and I will answer some of your questions and try to work through the information that we were just given. And then our hope is that you will join us at the tables and have sort of smaller group conversations specifically about traffic and green space and bike plans and walkable blocks and uh, noise and stormwater management and all of the important things that are go into this site. So with that, I basically just want to say thank you. This has been a journey that we have been on. I feel like it has been months of meetings and we have gotten a ton of feedback in so many different ways, in small group settings, in these large group settings, through the former task force, for the informal meetings. Um, you know, people finding me in Kowalski's on Sunday morning <laughs> and, and telling me, you know, what they're, how they're feeling about having a soccer stadium and how excited their kids are to be able to bike over to the games. And so I appreciate you being here tonight. And with that, I will turn it over to Donna, who is going to walk us through the master plan and the stadium site plan. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Kristen. <coughs> And good evening, everyone. I see a few familiar faces, so some of this might be a repeat for some of you. The um, site, obviously, that we're talking about is the, the Snelly Midway site, where the, the Midway Shopping Center is, um, and also what's known as the, the Met Council's Bus Barn site. So it's 35 acres in total, and uh, you can see the outline of the shopping center and some of the out buildings there. So back in October, uh, the team selected this site as the preferred site for a stadium. And the city and the team, Minnesota United and RK Midway, the owners of the shopping center, decided to work together and talk about a possible redevelopment plan for that whole um, super block. Uh, as Kristen mentioned, the, the, uh, the mayor asked the planning commission to oversee a process with a community advisory committee. We had lots of applicants for that committee. It was really great. We had 21 really engaged um, members of the community. We met um, nine times as with the uh, Community Advisory Committee. We've had four open houses, so the one tonight is number four. Uh, we had um, feedback opportunities on Open St. Paul. We had about 100 people visit that site and, and um, provide comments. And we did six additional outre outreach meetings to a couple of the high schools, Gordon Parks and Central, um, also uh, Skyline Tower. Um, um, the um, African Economic Development Solutions Group um, and, and a couple of others. And uh, just a reminder too that in, on March 2nd, the City Council slash HRA, same people just wearing different hats, uh, had approved uh, ground lease use development funding and environmental agreements related to this project. But um, a big piece of those agreements relies on a master plan and site plan being approved for um, the site. We also heard that jobs are really important to people and wanting to see jobs at this site and also concern about the existing jobs and existing businesses that are there. And so there was another group that was established and has been meeting over the past few months, the Snelling Midway Jobs Work Group, and really focused on how do we bring resources to bear on both um, potential business transitions if that's needed or bringing new businesses to the area. And that group, this shows you all the folks who are involved in that. So their report should be ready very soon and also available on our project website, which is um, stpaul.gov slash midway. And you'll see that um, on several of the handouts as well. So tonight is really a chance to um, show everyone what um, RK Midway has submitted for and, and uh, Minnesota United has submitted for the master plan and also um, what has been submitted for that site plan for the stadium. So it's sort of the first chunk of that whole 35 acres, what they'd like to start with. Um, so that you're well prepared to provide comments to the Planning Commission. Um, and just to clarify, all the comment tables are over here on the side. Uh, there'll be a chance to um, write a comment to the Planning Commission, which we will um, present to the Planning Commission on Friday if you can't make the public hearing. Or if you want, if you're ready to comment on the AUAR, we'll take those comments and 
all, all substantive comments on the AUAR must be responded to as part of the, the state environmental review process. So the Planning Commission were tentatively um, scheduling or anticipate, excuse me, anticipating July 8th for Planning Commission um, recommendation and then to the City Council in early August for um, approvals and a public hearing at that point too. So the next two upcoming chances for public comment um, will be public hearing on Friday at Planning Commission and then tentatively August 3rd at City Council. So this is, I'm just going to show some selected highlights from uh, the master plan submittal. And many of you have probably seen this. So this slide just shows how centrally located this site is. It's, it's great access to 94. It has um, the Green Line LRT running right um, in front to the north. The new A-Line BRT, which is actually starting service this Saturday, very exciting, up and down Snelling, and midway between the two downtowns. Uh, again, this is the site, so RK Midway, the owner of the shopping center, they own that piece, the 25 acres that are to the north and east there, and the Met Council owns uh, about 10 acres uh, to the southwest. And this, is, this was kind of an amazing slide to me when I first saw it, that this 35 acres, you could actually fit 12 blocks of downtown uh, within that. So there's a poten potential for a lot of um, growth and development and change here. The, um, the master plan articulates these principles for um, the site, uh, and they're all principles that are very consistent with the planning work that that the city has done with the community over the past few years preparing for uh, LRT. Um, Transit-oriented development, creating a walkable neighborhood, um, putting in new streets and reconnecting with the neighborhoods um, to the north and south and east-west um, so that it's, it's more um, walkable through the site and bikeable um, and for cars as well. Emphasizing public open spaces so there's a plan to add significant new green spaces here, um, a mix of uses and trying to get activities 24 hours a day. So a site that's active um, on weekends, during the week, uh, in the evening, so residential uses, office, retail, and also sustainable stormwater management. So again, a mix of uses, so just some images to show you what that means. Um, and creating public space that's really four seasons, so not just summertime use, but what are activities that could take place there in the wintertime. And of course, the idea that these big public green spaces could be used for some major community events, and here are some just examples from around the country. So here's the site plan. Um, this would be potentially, you know, the full build out, which will likely take a number of years to achieve. This is really a lot of uh, development, um, new streets and so forth. Um, so this shows the, the central green uh, running from the north part of the stadium up to University Avenue, so that's all green space. Uh, residential uses uh, along this side, hotels here, um, office uses on the, the west side along Snelling, and, um, and then uh, surface parking. This is the only surface parking plan long term for the site. And this is just an image at full build out of what it could be. And again, this is um, potential. It's not necessarily what exactly will happen. It will depend on if the market is there to support uh, that level of development. This image shows a little more detail on how uh, parking is proposed to be handled and retail uses. So the plan shows retail uses the orange at the first floor of all of these buildings. and. Um, Parking would be, is proposed for one level of underground parking below the retail to serve retail customers, and then parking for the office or residential uses above would be um, right above the retail level. And then we would ask that the you know, facade of that look like it blend with the building, the rest of the building. Uh, and they've shown the idea of um, cinema, fitness center here. Here's the hotel. Here's, again, the residential, the office space. And this just shows the block layout in the streets that's a little bit easier to see maybe on those other images. So again, this is, this is the stadium, this is new green space here. Um, the purple are all the development blocks, so those are the sites that are available for future development. 
This is, um, there's a lot of detail here, but I just wanted to show you that, that this is on our website if you want to look at it in more detail, but it shows how much development potentially could be on each of these blocks. And in total, all of the development shown here is um, a million square feet of office space, uh, 421,000 square feet of retail. That's about 100,000 square feet more retail than is on the site right now, so that shows an increase. And 640, um, or 600, yeah, 640 residential units and uh, 400 uh, hotel rooms. And then about 4,700 parking spaces that would be structured parking in all of these blocks. A little bit more about the green spaces. So here, these are the two primary green spaces north of the stadium. They have a really interesting idea of, um, along here, something they've called shops on the green. And here's an example um, of, of this, and I can't remember which uh, city that's from, but like little shops that, uh, or small restaurants that could be easily accessible from the park. And again, just a, kind of a blow up showing you the, the park spaces there in the center. They've also talked about really upgrading the streetscape along in, within the site and on the edges. So I just wanted to show you the Snelling image. Um, so this is uh, Snelling today. And this is, they're showing with new development set back quite a bit along that um, edge so that there's room for outdoor dining, much more room for pedestrians, room for landscaping to really make that um, a much more pedestrian friendly edge than it is today. Also a plan for putting a bike, oops, uh, putting a bike lane uh, through this main new street that would go through here called, it'd be an extension of Shields Avenue. So that would be a nice connection to get um, east-west with bikes. And then uh, the master plan does show sort of a district approach to stormwater management and using the green spaces here as um, storage and a possible water feature. Now this is the this is the piece that is new er and um, many of you maybe not will not have seen this. This is the site plan that's been submitted for the stadium. So this shows um, here's the stadium here, and it shows what's kind of in this red dotted outline is the um, the limits of the construction for this first phase. So it's showing building one of those green spaces here, and then the future second plaza green space would be built um, up here in the future. Building this surface parking lot, and if there's kind of an access ramp down to the, the surface of the stadium. The stadium is proposed to be sunk down about, I think, 18 feet below grade. And um, <clears throat> then until the um, the site is ready on the, the Snelling side for new um, office development or new development. They're proposing to use that um, area for temporary parking just on game days, um, and that would be temporary until uh, there would be a, a development proposed there. Um, you can see here that um, about half of the shopping center remains, and um, these outbuildings here along University are there. Um, so this is the like 2018 opening day site plan, the way it stands right now. And American Bank building is, is still here, of course, McDonald's, Perkins, and so on. And I think that's the last slide, and uh, I'll turn it over to Josh for environmental review. Thank you, Donna. Uh, I know a few folks in the room, but for those who don't know me, my name is Josh Williams. I'm a senior planner with the city's uh, Department of Planning and Economic Development. Thank you. And uh, I helped uh, coordinate for the city the environmental review process. Uh, environmental review is a broader category of which AUAR or alternative urban area-wide review is, is one form. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. Um, uh, to set the stage then for, for the Q&A and uh, uh, hopefully everyone will get a chance to visit at the boards and ask more detailed questions as we go. Um, so why environmental review and what is it? Uh, environmental review comes in a number of forms at, at the state level, uh, but it's basically a, a state mandated pro uh, process for projects of a certain size and it's really about information gathering. So it helps us understand when a project is proposed and it's really done in response to a proposed project, in this case, 
a soccer stadium and a, a master uh, plan for redevelopment of the remainder of the shopping center helps us understand well what are the potential impacts of that and, and what do we need to do to uh, where needed uh, mitigate those impacts um, in this case it is the size of the stadium uh, this the threshold for an outdoor uh, entertainment facility which includes uh, stadiums in the in the state is 20,000 um, in this case the we felt that it was appropriate to do the higher level of review due to the the size of the proposed stadium although it's uh, uh, at least initially right at that that threshold um, one of the advantages of AUAR is that uh, it, it covers a large area so in this case we're also looking at the proposed mass redevelopment master plan for redevelopment um, the level of development there may have triggered uh, environmental review down the road so it, it allows us to look at these things sort of holistically now uh oh wrong button sorry about that um, so again AUAR alternative urban area-wide review uh, it's really a two-part analysis that's simplifying a little bit um, to look at those potential impacts uh, of, of uh, multiple development scenarios um, and again uh, I'm gonna cover this a little bit but I will be around by the boards later if I have people have more specific questions about the AUIR um, and again it, it works well uh, when you're looking at a larger redevelopment area as we are in this case um, it also allows us to uh, develop multiple scenarios so the first part is we need to figure out what we're going to study. What do we need to study? Uh, the term for this is a scoping EAW. Uh, an EAW is a, a less complicated form of environmental review at the state level. Uh, basically, we're asking what development scenarios, scenarios should be evaluated. We obviously have one scenario, which is what is proposed, a soccer stadium and, and the master plan for redevelopment. Uh, to help us understand how the impacts come out of that, we also looked at another scenario. That scenario was based on the city's existing comprehensive plan uh, I'm sure folks in the room were involved in some way with planning for the Green Line uh, and for the Snelling Station area. So those are adopted city plans which contemplate um, certain types and intensities of development, uh, particularly around the Snelling Station area stadium in this case. So uh, we had that to uh, sort of provide a, a comparison scenario. Um, we also had to figure out, you know, what exactly are the issues we need to look at. There's a whole uh, range of issues we looked at, and I'll, I'll get to those in a few minutes. And then what kind of, what is the appropriate level analysis? How, how, how closely do we need to look at things? Um, the scoping AW, which uh, sort of laid out what we were proposing to do, was published back in February um, after a 30-day public comment period. Uh, we then finalized, really, the scope for the AUAR. Well, that brings us to part two, which is the actual AUAR. Um, and it's really what did we study and what did we find. Um, so the, the AUR kind of lays out what, what exactly we looked at and what were the assumptions we used to study things. We're looking at a development proposal, so we need to make some basic assumptions to understand how that projects out into the future. What potential impacts did we identify? Potential because it may or may not happen and it's about uh, being able to plan ahead for them. Um, and then, you know, planning ahead, what do we do? What do we do? How do we deal with these potential impacts? Um, we're also asking a question tonight, and that is, how did we do in this? Um, the whole purpose of this, it, we are at the draft stage. Um, we think we did a good analysis. We want to hear to make sure that uh, we, uh, that we did, and, and that's why we have the opportunity for comment, uh, both for individual citizens, residents, business owners, as, as well as state agencies have a role in this. And I'll talk a little bit more about, about what types of comments uh, are helpful in this process. Um, but that's where we are. Uh, the draft was published yesterday. It's a 30-day comment period. The comment period closes on uh, July 6th at 4 p.m. Uh, we do accept written comments. We accept comments by email. We're taking written comments here tonight. Uh, and I have a little bit more information on that later on on how you can submit those. Um, once we have those, the city will respond to substantive comments. Uh, and we will issue a final AUR and a f AUAR, excuse me, and a final mitigation plan. That mitigation plan lays out what do we need to do to deal with potential impacts? Uh, and that is a plan going forward that, that we must abide by uh, in, in conjunction with our partners. So general content, uh, I mentioned this before. There's a lot that goes into these. We used the existing state uh, issued EAW form as a guide, but it covers things like what permits are needed, what existing plans are out there. I mentioned the, the St. Paul Comprehensive Plan as well as the Snelling Station Area Plan. Uh, it looks at zoning and land use looks at sort of more natural resources like geology, soils, water resources, uh, skipping down fish, wildlife, plant communities. Uh, it also looks at some of the things that happen 
uh, in a city that's been developed as long as St. Paul. Uh, folks in the room may know that, that the Midway Shopping Center was previously the site of the uh, Twin City Streetcar Company, so there's a long history of uses on the site that can leave behind some contamination. Um, also looks at historic and visual resources, uh, air, noise, and light. I know noise is something that we've heard concerns about. And then finally, transportation, which is something that we've heard a lot about, um, whether it be by transit, uh, automobile, people walking uh, and biking, all of those things were looked at. So what did we find? Well, I'd say the top line message, uh, and again, you notice it says draft, because we're here to get comment on this and, and to get confirmation that, that we didn't miss something. Uh, is that the projects as proposed are, are viable. There, there's no major issues that come out that cause us to say this can't happen without having dramatic impacts. So it's a good message to take away. For most uh, areas that we looked at, um, the issues are sort of typical of large developments uh, and they may not require, uh, or, or they don't really require mitigation. So I have a couple examples. One I talked about uh, site contamination. A lot of work's been done to, excuse me, make sure we understand uh, what happened at the site historically in terms of those uses, what sort of soil contamination may, may be there, and it's getting cleaned up. It's through a typical process uh, that the MPCA manages for, for many, many developments, large and small. Um, they even have contingencies in place if they encounter something they don't expect. So that's pretty typical. Um, another example is uh, uh, air quality. Um, this is uh, in the area of a very busy intersection. Air quality has been a problem in the past. The analysis found that the proposed developments won't really substantially impact the, uh, the existing air quality, um, and it certainly won't come anywhere close to where it might need regulation or further study based on state, state standards. Um, so that's kind of a, a good portion of the AW, excuse me, AUAR. There were a few areas, and these line up with some of the areas where we've heard concern, where some management of, of, of impacts may be needed. Um, I'm going to give you a couple examples here and then I'm going to walk through them in a little bit more detail. Um, again, I don't, I'm not going to have time to go through everything that's in the AUAR, but that is why we have the tables here and I encourage folks if, if something here uh, gives you pause or you want to learn more about it, that's, that's why we have the experts here at the back of the room. Um, so some of those examples. Uh, we think a game day transportan management, transportation management plan will be needed. That's going to deal with parking. It's going to deal with, uh, it's going to include uh, police officers to direct traffic. It's going to include uh, use of transit, use of shuttles. Again, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. But it's about managing uh, the large amounts of people that would come to the site on, on those few days a year when there's a soccer game. Um, tacking to the master plan, so that's redevelopment of the rest of the site. If it builds out as proposed under the master plan, there may be a need to make some minor infrastructure improvements. It's primarily signal timing, adding signals, limited changes in terms of a turn lane. Again, we have the experts in the back of the room who can talk to you a little bit, up, a little bit more about this, and I do have a slide that, that highlights some of those things. That's in 2035, assuming all this new development on the site, new uh, retail development, commercial development, offices, housing, hotel, all move forward. And it's really not related to the game events, it's related to the rest of the site. Um, finally, final areas, there is the potential for some noise impacts. Um, they can primarily be addressed through scheduling of games. They primarily are with nighttime noise levels, so ending the games early enough that they aren't impacting folks. Um, possibly reduction of the, the ampli excuse me, amplification system uh, if needed. There are also some potential issues with proposed housing, uh, but that would be known going in. So let me get into a little bit more detail on the transportation and parking issues. Uh, I want to first cover a couple of assumptions because I think they're important to understanding the analysis. And again, this is for what we looked at in the, the environmental review. First assumption is that we, we solved for getting people to the game without the need for parking on street either on the site or in the neighborhood. In other ways, we found a way to get people to and from the game without people having to park in neighborhoods. That also includes, uh, or let me see, there's another assumption, which is that we know that we have limited on-site parking that we know is available. We know there are about 400 spaces proposed as part of the stadium site plan. Uh, the city has control over an, an additional 350 spaces at the spruce tree ramp that's right next to the site. 
Um, but we've not assumed any of the other parking that is available in the area, and there's a substantial amount, and I'm gonna talk about that in a little bit, but we haven't assumed that any of that is available. Uh, however, it could be, uh, it would just need to be managed in the same way that we're proposing to manage the, those game events. So, this is a little bit about that parking. Um, I think you'll find out one of the boards, something that gives you a little bit more detail about layout, but basically we have the, uh, the permanent parking Donna talked about on the west side of the site. Uh, we have the uh, temporary or interim parking, surface parking, uh, and then Spruce Tree Ramp. There's about 350 spaces at Spruce Tree Ramp. Those other two lots add up to about 400. Uh, it's about 460 total. Just to note, you know, if when, uh, when that is redeveloped, uh, that surface parking would go away, but it would be replaced by parking that would likely be available for game day events uh, as part of that redevelopment. I think Donna talked a, a bit about what those uh, development blocks might look like. Um, getting in a little bit more detail about that game management, we made some, um, we, this is how we structured transportation to and from the event. Um, this is for a, a, a event, a game on opening day 2018 or in the 2018 season. So really we only have the stadium development on site at this point. It's that situation we were just looking at. Um, we have people coming by uh, walking and biking from within the neighborhood, also using regular route bus service. We have LRT and BRT providing about 35% of the transportation to and from the game. The uh, A-Line BRT is opening in just a few days here. Um, we have that limited on and off-site parking. Uh, we made some assumptions about uh, auto occupancy and we can control that by tying access to those parking spaces to tickets purchased to the game. Uh, that gets another about 15% of the people to the game. And then we have the use of off-site shuttles. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about how that would work. Um, so the shuttle surface. Um, there are a lot of existing parking spaces right here in the, the core of the Twin Cities. We're not that far from downtown Minneapolis. We're not that, that far from downtown of our own city. The state fairgrounds are just north of the pro proposed stadium site on uh, Snelling Avenue. Uh, the University of Minnesota also has quite a bit of parking. Those are either commercial parking facilities, that is they exist solely for people to come there, pay and park their car, or they're large facilities that are managed for paid parking on a regular basis. People come there and pay, whether it be for events. Um, for events, they pay, they're managed. The point being that the people who own and operate those facilities know how to do this. It's their business. Um, so, and we have contacted them, letting them know that we've put this out there. The good thing is that really only a small portion of those spaces would need to be available to, to adequately serve stadium events. We've looked at locations that are within about 20 minutes, and ideally we could use two, maybe three of those uh, uh, locations to serve people parking by shuttle, uh, which would make it logistically work a lot better. And apologies for that typo. Um, so that is in contrast to some of the other parking opportunities that I'm gonna talk about in a minute, which are not commercial parking facilities. This is a graphic and I, apologize if it's a little difficult to read. It is reproduced on a board at the back of the room. I encourage you to go talk with the folks who helped us put it together, but it basically shows uh, by numbers of people how people would, what, what uh, modes people are traveling by down in the lower right hand corner. And then uh, it keys kind of how they're moving on the site. This is not a final plan, but it works based on uh, amount of room needed for people queuing to get on LRT, to get on shuttle buses, that was all analyzed pretty closely. If you dig into the appendices to the AUAR, it, you can see the graphics uh, and the actual analysis. Uh, but this shows basically how, in, in schematic form, how the site would operate on a game day. Um, so that other parking I mentioned. This is a blow up of a map that we were zoomed in on earlier. You see the yellow line is a one half mile boundary around the outside of the stadium site, the, the Snelling Midway super block. Uh, the orange line is three quarters of a mile. All those locations are in blue, in blue are places where we think there's quite a bit of available parking. Um, for example, uh, Midway, Old Midway Hospital Health East Campus has a, uh, quite a bit of parking. I don't remember the numbers off the top of my head. Those are available a lot of the time. They generally operate during business hours, uh, it not being a full hospital anymore. 
So there is a good chance that those, uh, those parking spaces could be available during event times, which game times, which are typically evenings and weekends. Um, we didn't include them in the analysis. Again, we wanted to make conservative assumptions to make sure that we were, you know, really fully analyzing the potential impacts. The good news is that because of event times, it's, there's good potential that these spaces could be available. Uh, if you subtract what we're already talking about, there's 3,500 spaces roughly plus at the sort of auto occupancy levels that could serve all those people who we have going by shuttle. Uh, we view that as a good thing, options going forward. These sites are all accessible without going through uh, the Snelling I-94 intersection, which is really kind of the key intersection from a traffic standpoint. So there's a lot of potential for use of these. That is something that we're gonna be looking forward, excuse me, looking at with our partners as we move forward and, and sort of try and figure out some of the details of this event management plan. Um, so that is parking again. Uh, that same information is produced at the back of the room. Uh, uh, I do encourage you to ask questions. Um, master plan build out, I talked a little bit about that. Um, if it gets built out at the density proposed, um, there's the potential for some need for inter uh, infrastructure improvements and in my next slide uh, highlights those. Um, but again, it assumes that level of development. It also doesn't include the fact that when individual developments that come in, like say a hotel that's proposed, would need to go through what's called a, a transportation demand management plan. Uh, a hotel, it might be more difficult because you have lots of folks coming from out of town, but uh, a business that has a lot of employees, we'd work with them, the city, to you know encourage the use of transit or carpooling, things that can reduce auto demand. Um, and again, that kind of talks about those. So um, I think the important thing is that those are uh, long-term and will be examined and the needs for those infrastructure improvements reassessed uh, and figure out how we how we make that happen as those developments come online. Uh, it's sort of a separate issue from the the event uh, concerns around the stadium. Oops, that's not gonna work. Um, so again, this lays out some of those improvements. Um, eventually, the current uh, signal at Spruce Tree Avenue will need to move to Shields. Uh, there's some debate as to when that should happen. Uh, we have, sorry, I'm not very good with buttons. Um, the, the BRT stations are at Spruce Street Avenue now, for example. Um, there are some other things that would change how that intersection works, some extension of turn lanes. Um, there's also some changes on Hamlin Avenue. I'm not gonna go too deeply into those, but if, those, if that's something you're concerned about, again, I encourage you to visit the boards in the back of the room. Um, finally, noise levels. I'll summarize this information. The state has noise standards. The city adopts our noise standards based on that. We use a, uh, a criteria called the L10, which is basically the noise level for a tenth of the time or six minutes out of every hour. And that, uh, that is measured in decibels, uh, a, a level decibels, which is, or a weighted decibels. Um, basically, uh, excuse me, from, uh, uh, at daytime for uh, residential receptors, that's right here in the middle. Um, the uh, noise level is 65 decibels. Um, and I think one of our handouts has a, has a nice uh, comparison that helps you understand how loud 65 decibels is. I think a vacuum is around 65 decibels at about 10 feet. Um, someone at the noise board, so I'll have to confirm. Um, then we have a, a slightly lower nighttime noise decibel, so from 10 p.m. to 7 a.m., that's 55 decibels. This is a graphic. Again, it's reproduced on our board. I'm going to point because it's easier. This, let's write one, this is the 65, 66 uh, decibel. Basically, um, at nighttime, if games don't end by 10 p.m., can folks still hear me? Um, there was a potential for noise levels to exceed uh, city standards in this area just south of the stadium across 94. We deal with that, again, by either reducing the noise, making sure the games end before 10 p.m. Um, we can get into a little bit more detail. My understanding is that the, the noise levels tend to be higher before the game rather than after. Uh, but again, it, it's something that can be managed. Um, the other issue is there's proposed residential development up here. Um, based on the contours we're finding, it is possible that residential development 
which is a class two receptor and that's what drives the uh, decibel restriction that if housing were built there then the, the stadium noise for day games would be in violation of, uh, of those noise standards as perceived by people in those residences. Um, that can be dealt with through um, again, reducing volumes, you can do design things to mitigate those standards. So if you're building new housing, plan for that. Um, the city also is, is able to issue variances. That would be uh, something for the city council to take up at that time. So there, there are ways to do, to, to effectively deal with those uh, potential impacts. A um, little bit more, this is actually my second to last slide. So uh, we're accepting comments again through 4 p.m. on Wednesday, July 6th, I encourage you uh, if you do have concerns to comment, um, these are the green forms at the side of the room. Um, we use a term called uh, substantive comments. That's what we have to respond to. What it means is, you know, if you like soccer or don't like soccer, that's great. We want to hear about that. That's certainly a relevant comment, you know, that you don't think it's a good use of the site on the, the site plan and master plan. Uh, in terms of the AUAR, we want to hear, well, is there something we missed? Is it that you know, we didn't do adequate noise investigation or we, we didn't, we missed some aspect of potential traffic impacts. Those are the types of comments that we can respond to uh, and use to sort of uh, check the AUAR. And that's the idea that before we get to the final, we, we've got one more round of input. Um, so I encourage you, if you're ready to make comments tonight, otherwise we have an email address set up, uh, snellingmidwaycomments at ci.stpol.mn.us um, by July 6th. This just summarizes the whole process to date. We began in January 2016 meeting with uh, some of our agency partners, particularly on figuring out this transportation analysis. So that was MnDOT, the Federal Highway Administration, Ramsey County, St. Paul Public Works folks, Metro Transit. Uh, went through that scoping process that I talked about, finalized uh, the scope of the AAR and issued a final order for review. Um, and then uh, just yesterday we published a draft AUR and, and here we are during the comment period. Um, once we've gotten those comments and responded to them, um, assuming we don't need to go back and do additional analysis, we feel that we've done a good job, but this is why we have the comment period, um, we would be wrapping up the AUAR process uh, for all intents and purposes by mid-July 2016. There's some additional comment times for agencies, uh, but in terms of individuals uh, once the comment period ends then we need to respond to those comments and uh, make a judgment as to whether or not uh, we, we've gotten to a place where we can issue a final AUR and mitigation plan.